recovery and field optimization. In these sessions, we have uh, five speakers and would like to introduce them. Hitisha Dadlane, a reservoir engineer from ONGC. Soilesh Prakash, lead drilling and production engineer, SLB. Then, uh, uh, Chris Freeman, technical director, Definitin. And our fourth speaker is uh, Sital Khat, managing director, SNF, Flow Pump India Private Limited. And uh, at the end, we are having Dipankar Dutta, Chief Chemist from Oil India Limited. May I now request Hitisha Dadlani to go ahead with her presentation, please. A very good afternoon to uh, all the delegates present here and to the session chair. I am Hitisha Dadlani, double reservoir from Oil and Natural Gas Corporation. And today I'll be presenting on field scale polymer flooding application in active aquifer driven reservoir of Mesana asset. <clears throat> to go back can I go back go back okay. Yeah. okay so let's start with the introduction of the field um, we were discovered in 1968 which is fairly half a century ago we are an unconsolidated sandstone and we have really good porosity and Darcy permeability and our pressures are still hydrostatic, which clearly indicates that we are an active water drive reservoir. And uh, now you must be wondering that we have such good porosities, permeabilities, and pressure support. We must be having excellent recoveries as well. But unfortunately, that's not the case. Our northern sector have, has high viscosity. So our viscosities are 50 to 120 centipoise. That's why we have moderate recoveries owing to low sweep efficiency and viscous fingering. While in the southern sector, the viscosities are less. It's 15 to 22 centipoise, where we have very good recoveries. Now, if you see the peak production of the field, we have we reached the peak of 1969 TPD, and uh, we are still producing 1620 TPD, which is 80% of our peak oil. So this peak oil, we are still able to maintain because of the different development schemes that have happened over the timeline of the field development. A few of these schemes have been mentioned here. Uh, there are total 10 non-EOR development schemes which resulted into drilling of 500 different wells. And we have we started EOR in 2017 uh, with 11 patents in the northern sector. They were executed, uh, uh, 11 inverted five spot polymer flooding patents. They were executed in January 2020 and uh, subsequently we have we have plans to expand this to 46 other patents covering the entire northern sector based on the performance which we'll be discussing today and we also have a surfactant polymer pilot going on in the southern sector and this surfactant polymer pilot is under evaluation now uh, giving you a brief of the scheme the current ongoing po polymer flooding scheme so we have a group of eight patents which are going and there's a group of three patents. Now, these, the difference between these two patents is the oil viscosity. So we have 120 centipoise viscosity in the eight patents and 50 centipoise viscosity in the three group of patents. Now, in the eight group of patents, as you can see the sand trend, we have an average thickness of five meters. And this thickness is devoid of any uh, oil water contact. So these are all up dip. It's an active edge water drive. While the group of three patterns, we have an average thickness of around seven meters with oil water contact, dynamic oil water contact at 985 meters. So in the down dip patterns, well injectors 606 and 609, we have oil water presence. So it's an active bottom water drive. Um, <clears throat> explaining you the polymer flooding performance. So the eight group of patterns started in January 2020 and these eight group of patterns uh, have, uh, have been producing at, initially we're producing at 1200 meter cube per day of liquid, 92% water cut, and the oil was 100 tons per day. Uh, within six months, we started seeing the response, our water cut decreased to 86%. 
and uh, now it is still uh, we are producing a liquid of 1700 meter cube per day at a water cut of 86 percent and the incremental oil is 140 tpd our peak incremental oil oil was in 2021 that was around 200 tons per day and these 11 patents have 21 direct oil producers and 40 odd offset producers uh, while in the three group of patents we started in october 2022 these three group of patents, we have uh, initial rate was 500 meter cube per day at a water cut of around 87%. And now we have increased the liquid to 700 meter cube per day. And our water cut is still in the similar range and we are producing an incremental oil of 25 tons per day. So this is how we are proceeding ahead. We are injecting 27 centipoids of polymer at 50 meter cube per day rates. Now, ahead of this, we'll be discussing the different strategies in the mid-course correction that we have done to maximize production from the EOR area. Um, the first thing is, before we start any EOR, it's important to know what historical production we had. We had an history of more than half a century, right? So to understand that, what we have seen is that majority of the wells that were initially drilled were drilled in the down-dip direction. So all the wells that were drilled where high production has taken up is in the down dip direction. Now, when we started drilling in the up dip direction, there was already presence of viscous fingers and channels of water from the aquifer, which actually leads to low production in the new wells in comparison to the wells which were drilled in Virgin Reservoir. So you can see that by the contour map of cumulative production as well. And we have placed our polymer patterns in such a way that they are in the areas where there is maximum unswept oil present as well. Going ahead, the next important part is to understand the water cut of the field. So when we started polymer flooding in 2020 in the eight group of patterns, you can see three colors, three magenta colors here. So these three magenta colors actually represent the aquifer entry point as well in the contour maps. So these are the areas where we had OWC in our contour maps. Uh, it is clearly visible in the map uh, on the right hand side. Now as we proceeded ahead in 2022 during our peak oil, you can see that the water cut which was in the 90 to 100% range has actually declined to 75 to 80% clearly visible near the pattern area in the 2022 uh, water cut map grid map in 2023 you are able to see that now the water cut has increased but in the up dip area it's still producing good and much lower than the water cut we had in uh, at the time we began so that is the thing now accordingly we have actually set our withdrawals as well so you can see that in the areas of high historical production and aquifer entry point, we have limited our withdrawal and kept high withdrawal in the up dip area. So this is what is visible in this. Uh, it's also important to know how polymer is moving in the system. So you can see that when we, after one year of starting polymer flooding, it is clearly visible in the eight group of patterns, our polymer was going everywhere. We had polymer in all offset wells, in all direct producers. This clearly implies a dispersion of polymer. As we proceeded ahead in the polymer flood, our polymer was all contained in the system near the pattern area. So this is what happened in 2022. Polymer dispersion reduced and it is all near the pattern area. In 2023, it further reduced, but our polymer concentration is not increasing now, which clearly indicates that our aquifer is much more active than what polymer we are injecting. As this was the first commercial, first of its kind commercial scheme, we started with 11 patents. Now to limit this dilution, we are expanding to 34 other patents in these two areas of the three patent, as well as the group of eight patents to mobilize more oil. Uh, obviously, EOR scheme helps us revive the vintage wells as well. So before the uh, flood, we were having 30% of the wells in this area were closed because of free water. Now all these wells are operating. So we have done different jobs to, you know, revive these vintage wells. We have done perforation optimization. So what we did was we retrieved the gravel pack. We actually uh, squeezed the existing interval and shift shifted the interval in the up dip direction. So basically, we perforated the top part of the reservoir and recompleted it, which let oil gain to us. The second thing that we did was 
as our wells were some wells were closed for more than 10 years for free water so to revive those wells at good productivity we went inside with ctu we cleaned our gp and revived those wells which led to withdrawal we also have some horizontal wells in this area where we bulldozed polymer in the heel region to limit the viscous fingers and increase the productivity which gave us oil and also we have revived just offset wells wherever we were seeing the polymer concentration basically the front moving we revived those wells and that led us to the majority gain that we are currently seeing our well productivity increased from 1.5 meter cube per day to more than 3 meter cube per day from the injection side we have been uh, actually monitoring hardness so it's very important to monitor hardness it's important to put good quality polymer inside so with the help of our entire team we have been monitoring hardness to limit the formation damage we also were monitoring turbidity so at there was a point in injection where our turbidity was high so you can see that the whole plot has a positive slope but as soon as we were able to restore the turbidity it again become a straight line slope so we were able to basically reverse the formation damage in the system to maintain the injectivity in the injectors as well we iron and do are a combo which actually uh, decreases the viscosity of the polymer substantially so to limit that we have actually designed courtesy to the reservoir field services team of mesana asset we have designed a sampler a polymer sampler downhole which collects the sample and tell us the viscosity so now we measure viscosities everywhere at the pump discharge at the well head as well as at the sand phase and as you are able to see that no amount of iron and oxygen ingress into the system to reduce the polymer viscosity so this is what we have been doing uh, in conclusion again good quality polymer is the key to success for any enhanced oil recovery method also uh, pattern optimization and mid course corrections are often governed by aquifer entry historical production and structural features lastly we uh, polymers basically any ur method is meant to you know monetize the vintage sick wells and increase recovery via that as well and uh, you have to take hard decisions to expand the system to inject more polymers so this is all part of the mid course correction finally i would like to thank my team which is not present here it's a collaborative effort I would also like to thank my SSM, HS Dayal sir, and my ED asset manager who is present here today, and uh, my my sincere thanks to the entire Mesana asset team, uh, ONGC management, and IEW for uh, uh, this presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tisha, for your excellent presentation. Uh, I hope we can uh, have some uh, takeaway, and it will help us in implementing other fields also. As we are also having some measured field, uh, heavy crude oil. So I will definitely get some input from this presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. May I now call upon Silas for his presentation? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and the session chair as well. Uh, it's actually a privilege to be back on the stage of India Energy Week uh, presenting a topic that's actually very close to my heart about drill beds. Now, a lot of people in the room would be thinking why a topic on, of drill bits is uh, in this particular session over here. So my first slide would actually be, uh, uh, will be uh, clarifying that particular doubt. But just to begin with, the, the topic of this particular presentation is to achieve dog leg severity, uh, like high dog leg severity in challenging applications around the world, right? So I'll begin with the problem statement, which I just now mentioned as to why we need this kind of a solution for our conference and particularly this kind of a session over here. So wells are getting difficult to drill, more challenging profiles are coming up every single day. There are such difficult trajectories are now being designed, especially to target those small pockets of oil that have been left in, uh, in, in, in the reservoir. At the same time, what we are trying to target here is uh, uh, like not just the leftover pocket, but directional drilling and covering a large area in a single field from a single pad like the wells which will be very close to each other needs to be drilled like almost neck to neck and target different zones now what it requires is a, a very sharp turn 
while drilling these kind of challenging lithologies right so the topic uh, that i'm going to talk about right now is designing a specific drill bit which will be run on directional tools uh, specifically push the bit rss now what a rss is it's basically a downhole tool that we utilize to drill uh, trajectories like uh, difficult uh, to drill trajectories whenever uh, let's say we have any directional well to drill these kind of tools with the pads the the blue portion that you see on the screen right these are the pads that actually come out and it pushes the bit and the directional assembly in the direction opposite to which we have to go and then the bha itself turns in that particular direction like just for the audience who is not very much aware about the rss i wanted to have that part so how and why this technology is going to help you is being shown now so the position statement here is that until now we had a very specific design of all the pvc drill bits which are made in two pieces one part which is the matrix part where the cutting structure is available that particular part is is kind of universal for all the all the different manufacturers of the bit the second part which is welded to this matrix part is what gives it the connection that is used in the drilling assembly now the shorter this distance is the shorter the cutting structure is from the pads of the rotary steerable system or the pads which actually does the directional work the faster and the quicker turns can be achieved in the well okay so uh, what we designed was that initially we used to have matrix bits and steel bits so matrix bits in general have a much more longer uh, uh, makeup length or the distance the l1 distance that you see around 14.2 inches that's kind of an average length of the cutting structure to the pads of the rss right now this gets reduced automatically when we go to the steel version now this has to do with how the steel bits are manufactured how those steel bits are braced the two pieces of the steel bits are braced together right now the third picture that you see on the short makeup length bit is what we designed now this was one of the uh, unique projects that was taken up uh, uh, by 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 a lot of uh, bit manufacturers but what we wanted to achieve was to make this length as short as possible now with this short length and the rotary steerable system where we have pushed the bit uh, uh, pads like the pads that push the formation we are able to achieve much higher dog legs now i'll i'll straight away move to the results but I, there are a couple of more things that i wanted to talk about the first thing is the manufacturing novelty now as i already said right if you look on the image on the right hand side this is how a conventional matrix or a conventional steel bit is made there are two different components one is having the connection the other one is having the cutting structure or the man made diamond that we use for drilling now both of those pieces are mated together and then they are welded to get a complete bit body and you can probably even see the weld which is shown in the aqua color right but now what we have started doing is that we have a single piece steel design that is manufactured and we brace the cutters directly on top of it the challenge comes in the hard facing part now why we do need hard facing is that we do not drill very benign formations right the formations are quite challenging to drill we have sandstone limestone siltstone like formations that can cut through the steel very quickly now to prevent that we need to have some hard facing done on the place where we have the cutting structure now to avoid or uh, let's say to make the process more simpler what we have started to use is use these 3d printed strips so earlier the hard facing that we used to do was done with uh, like was actually applied manually it was done with uh, tungsten carbide melted and placed on top of the cutters but now what we have started to do is we make these strips by 3d printing them with the same material and these materials are actually 400% more erosion resistant compared to the conventional uh, tungsten carbide that we used to have initially now we use these uh, strips on top of our cutters and the and we weld them so overall what it does is it reduces our carbon footprint as well like even though bit is one of the smallest component in the bha but it does contribute to a lot of uh, carbon emission especially when we have to do a lot of hard facing on the bits and this is where uh, we are trying to do our part for the uh, for the benefit of the world by reducing the carbon footprint is that instead of applying hard facing on the entire part the 
the particular let, let me see if i can have the laser yeah so this particular color that you see right this is the portion where the hard facing is supposed to be applied now instead of applying the hard facing on the entire part behind the blade we just have to apply it in the portion where the strips are placed so overall it it causes around 55 to 58% of carbon emission reduction and this is a big step for a small component in the bha which is the bed right now again you would be wondering why i'm talking about such a small part right the reason is that this small part can achieve wonders when used uh, in the right application if you use the right bit in the right application it can do things that people cannot even imagine now the thing here is that we had a particular case and this is a application that very recently happened in india just about 3 to 4 weeks back wherein we had to deliver a well where we were already at 19 degree inclination at around 1500 meters depth we had to drop to vertical from 19 degrees and then we had to kick off in the opposite direction and go up to 90 degrees and this kind of a profile is not usually attempted in india in fact this was one of the first wells that has been attempted with such a kind of a profile in india and when we did this what change we made in the entire bha was just the bit design what we changed was we removed that uh, additional shank length that we have in a pdc bit we removed that and we made the bit smaller by just around 30% now with this 30% reduction what we also ensured that was the bit was durable enough we had a matrix bit which is corrosion resistant because of the material itself that it has we changed that body to steel body because that's how we are manufacturing bits these days we made it more durable by applying those uh, uh, strips the uh, the 3d printed strips what we also ensured was that the aggressiveness of the bit was not reduced so when you are moving from a five bladed design to a six bladed design people usually think that the rop goes down but what we ensured was the junk slot area of the bit remains the same and that is the component that gives you sufficient amount of hole cleaning from the bit so that the bit does not get balled up and it does not slow down on the rop and what we have achieved is that this bit drilled shoe to shoe which normally most of the bits do right uh, for for these kind of profiles it reduced our afe by around 1.3 days now this is at no additional cost to any of the operators right but using a component by changing a such a small component in the bha if you are saving around 1.3 rig days in such a complex uh, lithology well or such complex trajectory that is a marvelous achievement right we had over 52% improvement in the dls output from the bha by just changing the bit and again the stability was uh, paramount because in this kind of a profile if you have unstable drilling conditions coming out of the hole with the bha becomes a problem so we had no tight spot no overpull no back climbing was required we came out of the hole smoothly as well and what we achieved was if you look on the table uh, towards uh, uh, the bottom part over here this table shows that how much efficiency the rotary steerable assembly the rss assembly was working at even with 50% uh, efficiency of the uh, rss we were achieving around 40% additional dls output which is basically how fast the wells are turning we were able to achieve it and uh, again overall rop was uh, uh, nowhere to be uh, compromised on and the good part is if you look at this particular slide right the green line was the planned trajectory of this well and red line was what we achieved right so this particular line from here we started drilling all the way to this particular point and if you see we were right on target throughout this entire interval we did not even miss a single point of uh, uh, the profile that we intended to make so that was uh, like what i really wanted to emphasize upon for the india application now what other application and how we can utilize this technology more for some enhanced oil recovery so that is where this topic comes into the picture let's say if you have a comp like uh, this is actually a case from argentina wherein they drill uh, the intermediate section in 8 and 1/2 inch section and then they use a 6 3/4 inch to drill through the curve and lateral and then drill around uh, uh, around uh, around 7000 feet which is around 2000 uh, meters plus of lateral interval so usually what they do is they drill it in two trips the first trip is used to drill the curve part get the well into the desired zone or the desired sand and then continue drilling the lateral in the second trip now what we are trying to achieve here is that one single assembly can 
do such fast kick off it can enter the sand quickly and let's say around 20 to 30% of the sand interval that you are missing out from in your production zone that can be captured with the help of this particular bha and this particular bed design and that is where this topic actually makes sense to be a part of this uh, particular session as well right so uh, what we have been until now been doing is that we have been designing two different beds for these two different runs that we have right the first bit builds and the second bit just holds that angle and it ensures that we are inside the sand what we have achieved with this particular uh, uh, setup is that one single bit has been able to drill both of those intervals and be in the sand for a longer duration of the time so efficiently what happens is if you have to trip out from this kind of a depth right from 3500 meters it costs the rig anywhere around 2 to 1/2 to up to 3 days of time so that much time reduction is again contributing to your carbon dioxide emission reduction as well as giving you the production faster and again since you have a longer length to produce from you, it does produce for a longer time as well right so that that's all that i have today for the presentation thank you so much and thank you so less uh, and uh, because you have given some insight to the bit design and improving the drilling performance i hope it will help us in uh, improving the productions from our uh, measured or uh, new fields thank you may i call upon uh, chris freeman for his presentation please okay uh good afternoon ladies and gentlemen madam speaker um my talk is going to be slightly different because you really need to look at it from a strategic point of view now so we're coming up from the detail um some of you will have heard of gaffney klein and associates we're an international consulting energy consulting company based in the uk uh we've been working in india for about the past 25 years um a lot of that time has been with ongc Okay, so I'm going to talk about mature field, uh, optimizing recovery and production from mature fields. Um, many of you will know that around about 60% of the world's oil production is from mature fields. Um, those fields that are sort of greater than 20 years old. Um, and again, many of you will know that the recovery factors typically for an oil field is probably around about 35%. but it could be increased to sort of 55%. So, a lot of potential. The key thing to remember is that if you could increase the recovery from these fields by only 1%, this is almost the same as finding a sort of 100 to 200 million barrel oil field. Um and some of you will know that trying to explore and find 200 million barrels is a very expensive business. So therefore the key thing is that it's worth investing in these old fields because you can get more and more oil coming out. Just uh, as a local example, I mean the Mumbai High Field is ONGC's largest mature field um with a in place volume of about 13 billion barrels and there's lots more to recover. Um the the This diagram here is just really about recoveries. Um I mean most of these old fields were into secondary or even tertiary recoveries. So in terms of mature field optimization, I mean how do you go about increasing the production? Well the first step is to have a look at all the data. Um and again, you know, we often say you need to go back in time. Um right back to when some of the wells were drilled. and you'll find that in fact there's probably really important information that when the well was drilled um they had lost circulation or they had other issues which later in field life when you have a problem with the well you know that data is really important so never throw away your old data and the th- the key thing really is reservoir management we heard a little about from the first speaker about reservoir management about how it's so important and we'll mention that again in a minute and the collection of data but the key thing for mature fields is that you've got to have a multidisciplinary approach in other words 
you've got to look at the subsurface, you've got to look at the wells, completions, facilities, and commercial. In other words, it all has to be looked at together because that's the only thing that is going to help you in terms of going forward. There's lots of challenges in uh, mature field optimization. I mean, it is difficult, it's time consuming. When you're trying to get more and more oil out of an old field, you have to spend more and more time. You have to spend more and more energy and more, more and more uh, personnel and equipment. And you've also got to be really clever about how you use new technology and new systems. Um, and one of the things that people seem to forget is that even with an old field, you still need to use classical approaches as well as new technology. So, I mean, I'm a reservoir engineer by background, and so the classical reservoir engineering that we've been using for 50 or plus years is still important. You don't have to and should not rely on reservoir simulation models, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The, the reservoir is often telling you things so classical approaches, and I mentioned again about the data, uh, never throw away data, make sure that you know where it is so that you can use it. Obviously, new technologies can be really helpful. I mean, 3D visualization, 4D seismic, and I've got a couple of examples. You'll see the difference with 4D seismic, how it, what it can make. Um, and, and obviously, don't forget about you know, fracture stimulation and these other things. So mature field reservoir management, I mean, as I say, you heard from the first speaker, this is really, really important. And the reservoir teams, um, I mean, we encourage them, they need to be energized, they need to be inquisitive, um, and they need to interact uh, with the facilities group, the wells completions group, because the multidisciplinary approach is the only way that you're actually going to increase production. This is what we call well reservoir facilities management. So it, this is the sort of mechanism that combines facilities, subsurface, and wells all together. And by having this group work together, you can find opportunities for improvement um, and ways to actually improve both production in the short term and ultimate recovery. Continuous improvement is key. I mean, the team should be motivated. Um, they should be asking questions all the time. Um, and this includes the um, people at the uh, operational end, whether they're offshore or at the field development. So for example, you know, how do we reopen shut-in wells? What can we do? What are the options? How much do they cost? Let's prioritize which well. And I mean, some of these fields, some of these mature fields have like uh, you know, 700, 1,000 wells. And many, many companies that we've dealt with, you know, they don't know where to start. They just don't know which should they spend the money on. And that's something that you really have to look at the details, you have to look at the data, you have to look at the performance so you can design. Collection of more data, and again, we heard from the first speaker about how collection of data is really important. And it's still really important, even though the field's been producing for 20 years. So more production logging tools, to help him understand the water injection and improve reservoir sweep. And again, we heard from the first speaker about the polymer example. So we have to ask these sort of questions. Are we prioritizing on the right things? And then flagging and solving issues. And often in many, many cases that we've dealt with, we're trying to encourage innovation and out of the box thinking. So in other words, you need new people, young people to come in and question, you know, why are we doing this? And, he, and some of the older guys will say, well, we, we tried something different 20 years ago and it didn't work. Well, it probably didn't work 20 years ago. The field is now completely different. Production is much less. And so you need to test, test things, try out new different things. And, and again, are there other things that we can, that we can use? So I'm just going to run through some quick examples. The first three, they are from uh, North Sea oil fields. Uh, most of the North Sea oil fields in the UK now are mature fields. And so this just sort of shows what difference it can make. So you can see that in this case, there was a new operator came in, completely different, 
questioned everything and asked all the staff and everything to come up with new ideas. Some of those were implemented. Obviously, uh, government tax incentives made a big difference and that resulted in a, a 1.4 billion revised FDP and you can see what impact that had on the production. Again, this is another field. Um, I'm gonna go through these fairly quickly. Um, you can see here there was other options were looked at. In other words, wind energy synergy. So in other words, they decided that they would build some wind, uh, floating offshore wind to generate power, which would save burning the gas, which meant that they could then produce and sell the gas, which would improve things. Um, and also in this case, there was new satellite times and interventions. This is a field that you may have heard of. It's the 40s field. It's the largest oil field uh, offshore UK. Again, you know, similar story. New operator, new motivation, focus, different investment, and then 4D seismic. Now, the 4D seismic showed uh, oil that was unswept, which led to a whole bunch of infill wells, which, as you can see in the lower part of that graph, increased production further. This is a, a, an, uh, an Indian example, I'm not saying where it is, but these are the sort of various phases to keep production increasing. And the, at the end there, you can see there's a prize because there's things you can do to maintain production. So, conclusions. Most global oil production is from mature fields. It's not the new fields necessarily. Mature fields require completely different reservoir management philosophy. It's hard work, it's labor intensive, but as I say, if you can increase recovery by just 1%, which is a small amount, then it's equivalent to uh, discovering a new medium-sized oil field. We need very smart staff. We need young guys, we need people to be inquisitive, problem solvers. And all data is important. I've probably said that several times, but you cannot overemphasize that. All data is important. Having the right tools is important and continuous improvement, ranking and prioritizing remedial options. As I say, a lot of companies, they can't decide where to go or what to do first. But if we're clever and we have the right resources, we can always, in every case, improve production, improve recovery, and extend the life of the field, which hopefully improves our lives and the country. But to focus, we need smart people, we need strong leadership, and we need investment. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chris, for beautiful presentation. Now I request Sital uh, to go ahead with his presentation, please. Good afternoon, everyone. So, uh, thank you for giving the opportunity and uh, thank you for the session chairperson. So, maximizing oil production uh, from the mature assets in a sustainable way. Why we choose this topic? Because uh, nowadays the new discoveries are very less. And when we are having the new discoveries very less, we have to optimize the production from the existing field. How can we take it further? Where we can develop this, uh, means we can recover maximum crude oil from this field. So what is the, means, uh, as uh, Hitisha has given the very good outline, she has made my presentation very uh, positive because the field conditions where the polymer flooding has been implemented, and it has given the extra oil gain. And even Gapini has given that, yes, mature fields need to be developed further so that we can recover maximum crude oil and from the field, from the existing field. And that will be the win-win situation for the oil operator as well as for the country. So when we are going ahead with the polymer developing widely, it is a proven and easy technology what we have. It is more than a proven technology for three, last three to four decades in the world. It is again more than 300 references are there where the polymer flooding has been implemented in successful way. And it is, uh, this polymer flooding is nothing but the viscous oil fluid, we can say. Because we are increasing the water viscosity so that 
it will displace the trapped or residual oil what is there to the production well and for this there are means uh, minimum equipments are required on the fields where we can optimize the cost of these things from 3 to 6 barrel extra uh, recoveries what we are getting those so even by uh, polymer threading we can reduce the co2 emissions as well because that is the need of the our what we are discussing we are discussing for the esg and all the things the world is saying that yes polymer uh, means with crude oil we are having the high carbon emission but without with uh, without the crude oil we cannot do anything we are means people are concentrating only for the energy sectors but what about the pet chem with the pet chem it is there in uh, right from the mining sim, uh, ceramic textile paper sugar water treatment everything it is again linked to the crude oil from crude oil we are taking the uh, uh, propylene from propylene we are taking the acryl nitrile acrylic acid and from there we are producing again the polymers for to sustainable development of the human being so uh, we cannot think that crude oil has to go out of the situation we have to live with it and that is the need of the hour so what is the potential of the polymer flooding so polymer eur itself is a technology where we are getting the sustainable uh, production even 8% uh, means uh, the rate of decline uh, per year is 80 uh, 8% and with the polymer flooding or the eur technology what we are going ahead because everything has a pros and cons means when we are moving ahead with the polymer flooding or asp or sp or even the steam injection or microbial enhanced soil recovery as well so everything has the pros and cons or co2 sequestration as well we hear the lot of papers on the co2 or the thermal recovery and all the things but again those to implement in the field that is quite difficult as well and how to capture the co2 and all the things but when we move for the forward for the polymer technology we can inject it on the fast track where it is uh, we have to adapt to the sub surface requirement that is the salinity the temperature conditions and other parameters which are minimum which we can uh, syn synthesize those uh, uh, mis conditions on the surface and we can get the good recovery factor from the fields as well so where uh, we have mis ambitious economic uh, Uh, uh fields as well where the ks sorbi who is the uh, again the pioneer into the polymer flooding there are almost no reserves which are not appropriate for polymer flooding or at least giving a serious consideration to polymer why he is saying those things because he has spent miss uh, those who are into the eor or into the polymer flooding or asp they can uh, we refer the ks sorbi as a bible for polymer flooding because all these fields we are doing the polymer uh, means water flooding where if we enhance those things with a viscous fluid there is no harm to the fluid, uh, field but we are gaining the extra oil as well where that is counting to 12 to 15% of extra oil gain and that is much more important when we are looking for the mature fields here as poly polymer flooding uh, better than the later as uh, hitisha has defined the field which she has been working it was a mature field for 50 years but uh, whereas uh, we can have the cane example as well where they have started the uh, started implementation of chemical eur from the uh, secondary phase itself or initially from when they started the producing the crude oil from the mangla uh, field itself so they went ahead for the enhanced oil recovery so that way we need not have to wait for the uh, production uh, to get mature for the primary recovery is completed then the secondary or like that whatever we can implement on the fast track accelerate the production and that is the important for us means all the oil operator or even uh, when uh, 
yesterday or day before yesterday our prime minister was saying that we we have to recover more oil and secure the energy how can we do that there are no more discoveries but with the uh, these technologies we can implement on the fast track we can get the extra oil gain from these existing fields and we need not have to wait that water cut has to go about 90 95% even i have seen some of the fields where they have gone till 98% of the water cut and then they were looking for the ur why to wait for that time why can't we implement those things at the early stage and we can accelerate the production from those fields and we can recover more uh, crude oil from the fields as well as this technology is quite simple because why i am saying quite simple when the uh, the people who are not habitual to the chemistry they think that putting the hands into the chemistry is a difficult task and nobody want to put those things into the field and but there are service companies where integrated services can be taken up you monitor what is as per the reservoir conditions you require the flow rate what is the ppm dosage you require and then the service companies will take up so that what we are looking for so if we are doing the water flood we will get the fingering effects like this and and ultimately we are injecting the water and we are producing the water and it doesn't make sense after certain period of timeline and then we we have to think that whatever the residual or trapped oil is there how can we recover more from these fields and how can we get the better sweep efficiency from these fields and we can recover maximum oil from the fields as well and that is what we can accelerate the production as well in the shorter notice so as ishita has given the very good presentation in that oil water cut and the oil rate as well so the same what we can see in these fields as well when we are implementing the polymer flooding we can accelerate those things again as a uh, chemical eur or polymer eur it is again a myth that uh, it will increase the carbon footprints but it will not increase the carbon footprints it will definitely reduce the carbon footprints as well why because i will come to the second slide so in this you can see when when we are doing the water flooding we are injecting suppose uh, uh, 10 barrels of uh, water we are producing 90% water cut is there almost 9 barrels and one barrel only for the crude oil and with injection with production we are increasing the co2 percentage when we are having the polymer flooding we are reducing the water cut to 70% 3x time of uh, time more oil is produced again and 3x time less injected water to be handled because currently the whatever the produce water is returning that is again a big challenge for each and every oil operator how to treat it how to recycle it how to reinject it into the fields or to the disposal well again so that is what it is not affecting to the environment but again we are contributing with these things to lower the emission factor as well and that is the need of the hour how can we minimize the co2 emission with the polymer flooding as well as you can see the here uh, we have done miss we have presented one paper uh, on this topic which is a big topic as well but it is quite interesting when the oil operators or the their finance team they are looking for how to minimize the co2 emission in the fields as well so at the same time earlier the polymer miss when we screen the fields we have the certain constraints earlier that polymer will not work for the high viscous fluid the temperature we have we will have the constraint or depth of the dirt the salinity or permeability as well but that was the case in 70s or 80s what we we used to see but in uh, this is the case when uh, in uh, 2016 or like but what we can see currently currently the worldwide we are injecting even at 10000 cp as well so which was earlier the classic case 
for the thermal recovery and where it is giving good results even with the polymer or asp as well even at the temperature of 130 degrees celsius so earlier polymer if you know the co polymers what we use those are uh, they can retain the viscosity at only 80 to 90 degrees c and with this uh, new development we can enhance the temperature stability at 125 degrees c and that has been field implemented even in the carbonate reservoir as well because some of the ongc guys they they ask me uh, is it possible into the carbonate reservoir where we have the 125 degrees c and all the things we are already injecting into the middle east offshore again into the carbonate reservoir with these things as well and even at the salinity which is again compared to the sea water salinity as well and we have field implementation with minimum permeability of 50 milli darcy as well so all those challenges if we work together then we can minimize our polymer optimization we can design the polymers based on the field conditions and then we can have the different uh, means uh, which were earlier not the lucrative case for the uh, eor or polymer flooding that can be made as a good candidate for the eor as well again you can see the oil rate when it was uh, getting decreased and with this even the polymer uh, means uh, we are getting the extra oil gain with the water cut coming down as well so even uh, again the polymer flooding when we uh, go for those things we think that okay for pilot as well we require three to five years to develop it and all the things but that is not the case the service companies have developed several things that we can plug and play and we can implement these polymer flooding on the fast track basis where within three months we can start the injection as well to get the injectivity test because what is required if we keep doing the uh, laboratory studies it will take three to eight months if we go to any texas a m or ut they take six to eight months as well then again the simulation will go uh, go ahead and all those things but what we say when you have the water injection why can't you go for the injectivity test with the tracers you can uh, track it which are the dearest wells we are getting the good recovery factors as well what is the channels we can able to develop and then the pilot studies can be done immediately on those things so what what we want to say then you can implement the large scale like kane has done or pdo oman has done with the large scale as well the pilots can be completed within six months six to eight months if the spacing is 100 meters or less than that one you will get the recovery factor immediately from those nearby wells and then we can uh, go for the field development plans on the fast track basis again the same uh, uh, what we can face the problem is the offshore as well where uh, it is a myth that uh, polymer flooding or chemical ur will work only into the onshore fields and not off, not for the offshore fields as well offshore fields are again quite lucrative for the polymer flooding or asp as well uh, there are more than 12 references where the polymer flooding is going on even whatever the constraints we have that polymer how to get transported on the surface if the platform is having the limited space or uh, even the wet constraint as well all those things can be optimized and it it is possible where you can see in one of these slides we uh, we got only 20 meter by 20 meter spacing to place all the equipments for the offshore platform as well and that way it can be developed and it can be injected even some of the fields means where the constraint was there on the platform we cannot place the equipments we can put all those things into the barge and we can use the emulsion as well because they uh, that is the need of the hour that you need not have to go for the powder polymer you can go for the liquid emulsions as well you can put the barge sorry so on the uh, means this is powder uh, uh, polymer powder form 
right from the barge, we can take it on the, onto the platform and we can prepare the solution on the yes, platform sir. and then we can go for the injection. Sorry, could you please summarize your presentation, please? Okay. And then uh, for the liquids, we can see uh, if it is an immersion factor. So on the barge itself, you can have the entire solution and you can go for directly injection from the platform. Only the HP pump is required on the platform where you can minimize all the space constraint, wet constraint and everything. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sital, uh, for this presentation. This was an excellent presentation. Uh, I hope our audience will uh, get some insight from your presentation. Thank you. May I now request Dipanka Dutta to go ahead with his presentation, please. Respected sessions here. Dignitaries from various organizations, then my senior colleagues, friends. So thank you for staying with me till the last session. Uh, yeah, uh, let me start with my presentation on the topic. It is a low salinity effect on uh, oil recoveries in sandstone reservoirs of Upper Assam Basin. So it is a case specific laboratory study on Lakadangtheria, Bar Island, Middle Tipam reservoirs of Upper Assam Basin and uh, uh, these are these fields are chosen from uh, three different fields of Oil India Limited. So I am talking on behalf of my co-author, Dr. Deepak Jadi Kolita, as well. So the yeah. So the objective of the study. So we are all familiar that uh, it is essential to maintain the uh, reservoir uh, pressure and also uh, to in recover the incremental oil as secondary recovery process while uh, flooding water. So during the last two decades, uh, as my uh, earlier friend told that water flooding is also a uh, part of improved oil recovery. So during the last two decades, this low saline water has been uh, found to be the most prominent and efficient recovery te technology developed worldwide. Yeah, uh, basically this technique has several advantages as well. So for uh, new fields or uh, uh, which fields are say about to be measured. So in such fields we have actually uh, high efficiency of uh, displacing light to medium gravity crude oil. Then also we have uh, ease of injection of uh, water into the oil bearing formations. Then also we have the availability and affordability of water. Then also we have the lower capital and operating costs as compared to other IOR and UR methods. So which makes it more favorable uh, in terms of economics. So the basic need is that we have to have the lower salinity of the injected water than the formation water salinity. This is just the basic need. So uh, in Oil India Limited, we have more than 20 numbers of reservoirs which have been injected uh, low saline water injection. And in this study, as we have already mentioned, three geologically different reservoirs have been selected. So uh, the main, per yeah, so the main objective of this study is to investigate the effects of the uh, injected water salinity and its potential for oil recovery in low saline environment. So if we look forward for mechanisms of this uh, study, it is very complex and uh, we all know that uh, it depends on several factors like the uh, formation lithology, the um, composition of formations, then also the uh, properties of crude oil, then also the uh, composition of injection water and many other factors. So. Yeah, this is the, uh, just the schematic view of the geological formations of Upper Assam Basin. So, uh, the zone of interest are lying mostly in the Tipam, Barail, and Lakadang Ferry Reservoirs. So, it is just a area specific um, overview of the formation lithology. In certain cases, there are uh, formations where the um, formations you will find up dip above 4000 meter and down dip below 5000 meter as well. So the concept behind the study, uh, 
Yeah. So in many recent uh, research papers, uh, the salinity of lowest saline water was uh, flooded was considered to be as uh, low as 1,000 meter and above, where the salinity of the formation water is around 140,000 to 36,000 ppm. But in our case, uh, the lowest salinity of injected water has been considered as low as 14 to 30 ppm only. Whereas the information injection, uh, formation water salinity is also as low as 2000 to 30,800 ppm only. So this uh, low saline water flooding results in a significant uh, incremental oil recovery in uh, simulated field condition while we test it at laboratory level. So uh, here we will show you uh, uh, certain experimental procedures and data measured during the unsteady state low saline water flooding, uh, core flooding experiments. And also we will uh, see the results as well. So it is just uh, uh, go through the equipment used during various laboratory experiments, starting from the core plug preparation to viscosity measurement of crude oil, then uh, helium porosity and air permeability measurement, then core flooding equipment, all these equipment and many other were utilized, right? So uh, to predict the uh, incremental recovery from a reservoir, a series of core flooding experiments were performed on two numbers of core plugs from each reservoir. So a total of six core plugs were tested on uh, from these three reservoirs. So the difference of the core plugs were from uh, 28, uh, 28 meter to around 3602 meter. And as I already told you that salinity of formation water ranges from 2000 to 3800 ppm only. And the crude oil characteristics show that the uh, crude oil from all the reservoirs were around medium gravity crude oil having API of uh, 23.8 to 29.9 and viscosity around 6.5 to 14.8 centipoids. From the routine core analysis data also, uh, we have chosen the core plugs from each of the reservoir having the similar and comparable helium porosity and air permeability results so that we can utilize this uh, similar and comparable core plugs for core flooding experiments and carry out the comparable uh, studies as well. Uh, let me discuss the uh, experimental pro procedures that we have uh, performed in sequence one after the another. So these experimental procedures were basically uh, uh, found to be the most suitable and uh, uh, widely accepted in various recent uh, research works. So let me explain the steps. This uh, in short, this is saturated the core plug with prepared brine of formation salinity, then flooding with crude oil at bottom hole temperature of reservoir, then aging of the core plug in crude oil at 60 degrees centigrade for 21 days to attain the wettability. Then flooding with the crude oil in the same direction for dynamic uh, condition. Then flooding with formation brine. And lastly, but uh, flooding with the low saline injection brine. So let me discuss the results and finding as quickly as possible. Yeah. Uh, yes. So if we see the um, uh, bar diagram of the injected brine salinity of uh, the co two core plugs versus the residual oil saturation of the Lakadang carrier reservoir, the orange one is showing the formation brine salinity and the blue one showing the injected brine salinity. So if you see, uh, there is a significant uh, reduction of residual oil saturation while flooding with the uh, low saline brine of 30 ppm salinity rather than utilizing the 2500 ppm of salinity brine. So from the relative permeability plots also, it is observed that the water permeability is lower while injecting the low saline water in, uh, as the whole system becomes more water weight. And there is this incremental reduction by, uh, sorry, there is an incremental recovery of oil by reduction of the residual oil saturation. So similarly, in case of beryl, you can see uh, that there is an incremental recovery of residual oil uh, has improved by 10% while flooding with 14 ppm of uh, brine 
in terms of uh, 14 ppm, we could recover around 10% of incremental oil by reducing the original uh, residual oil saturation. So uh, the relative permeability plot also shows the same for the barrel reservoir. And if we see uh, the middle deepworm reservoir, here the formation saline brine in, uh, formation brine salinity is also very low. That is only 2,000 ppm. And even then, we could find around seven to nine percent of recovery from the initial uh, residual oil saturation. And there is a very good. Uh, demonstration from the relative permeability plots as well. So, uh, I have a few uh, opinions on mechanism since it is uh, really very difficult to uh, explain the mechanism of low salinity water injection. But I will just touch upon a few points uh, described by few uh, eminent uh, writers and uh, research workers. So as described by G.R. Gerald and his team, brine chemistry is very important to predict the incremental oil recovery in case of low saline water injection. So only salinity cannot be considered as directly proportional to this. And also we can see from uh, McGuire and his team, so no benefit of oil recovery when we reduce the salinity of the formation water from 23,000 to 7,000 ppm. But as we reduce the salinity below 5,000 ppm, we are getting an incremental oil. So that is again an, uh, some kind of alkaline uh, environment as he explained in his paper. So the most uh, favorable one can be depicted from this paper from Y.A. Hadi and his team that the injected water first goes to the high permeable channels and the low permeable channels remain unswept. When we reduce the salinity of the injected water, this water goes to the low permeable channels as well and further drags out the original oil in place. So these are the few mechanisms that we uh, could find and may, there are many other papers which depict uh, different mechanisms as well. So in concluding remarks, I must say that utilization of low saline water uh, significantly enhances the water flooding performance by recovery enhancement up to a maximum of 10% in case of uh, barrel reservoir compared to a maximum of 9% in middle tipam and 6% in lacadang ferry reservoirs from these laboratory experiments. And it is obvious that uh, once we reduce the salinity of the injected water, the sweep efficiency gets improved and the low saline water sweeps better the re remaining oil originally in place in these sandstone reservoirs. So finally, uh, these studies showed that the injection of low saline water is highly beneficial for these three sandstone reservoirs. That is basically Lakadangtheria, Bara Island Middle Deeper Reservoirs of Upper Assam Basin in India. So that's all from my side. Thank you, IEW team and Oil India Limited for uh, supporting me to come over here and present in front of you. And all you present here for staying with me since the last minute of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Dipankar, for your for sharing the knowledge and uh, whatever work you have done. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, there is no question and answer sessions as advised by the management. So management has advised us that there will not be any question and answer session. So we have to go with that and listen. Sorry. So with this, we are concluding this session. Thank you. Thank you all.